next hear from Hal Finney. I want to prove to you that I know a message that hashes to a, a given a hash value using the SHA-1 hash. I don't want to reveal anything about the message to you. Uh, it's a zero knowledge proof, and I've written a program to do this, which I will tell you about. Here's the, the basic model that we have. Uh, Peggy the prover knows the message, and uh, we have Victor the verifier that she's going to make this proof to. So she sends a commitment to the message over to Victor, which uh, locks her into the message without revealing any information to Victor about it. Now what we're going to do is, she's going to go and calculate the SHA-1 hash on this message, and Victor is going to start with the message commitment, and he's going to calculate simultaneously with her uh, a commitment to the SHA-1 hash. She's going to help him do this as they perform the calculation together, but of course again without revealing any information about the message. At the end, she has the hash, Victor has the commitment to the hash, and uh, she'll open the commitment. He can verify that it matches uh, what he calculated, and that's how he'll know that uh, this was the message that, uh, that she knows the message that hashes to this value. So the motivation for doing this, lots of the uh, presentations that we hear about will say, this particular protocol could of course be done with general purpose zero knowledge and perhaps multi-party computations, but uh, those, uh, those techniques are inefficient or they're impractical. So I wanted to find out just how inefficient, just how impractical they really are. Uh, I picked Shaw because obviously there's not going to be any kind of an elegant uh, zero knowledge proof of a Shaw hash because the whole algorithm is designed to be uh, complex and irreversible. So it's really meant as a benchmark to see what the state of the art is for uh, zero knowledge proof systems that can handle general and irregular problems like this. The proof system that I'm using is uh, one by Kramer and Domgard will be presented this Thursday, right, right here in crypto, uh, Zero Knowledge Proofs for Finite Field Arithmetic. It's uh, very efficient and it's quite flexible. Um, there's, uh, I've implemented two of the generators they describe in their paper, one which is suitable for zero knowledge arguments where the prover's privacy is protected unconditionally, and the other for zero knowledge proofs where the prover is unconditionally bound, it depends on what model that you're using. A nice thing about their system is that you can either do commitments to values up to the size of the group order in these discrete uh, log systems, or you can uh, do bit commitments, which are just the value commitments restricted to this range. Um, and I, I make use of that quite a bit in my uh, program. And another nice thing about it is it allows uh, pre-computation of the commitments. The prover and the verifier can uh, work together and calculate a pool of bit commitments ahead of time, which is relatively expensive, and then once they've done that, they can go through and actually perform the protocol in a relatively short period of time, which you'll see in the results, relatively. <laughs> just a brief description of what SHA-1 looks like. Not, not going to try to really describe it, but just to give you an idea of what uh, operations are involved in it that we have to be able to simulate. The message, in the case that I'm doing here, the message is known to fit in just one SHA-1 buffer. So there's that amount of information is leaked about it, but it doesn't matter the actual length of it. The message is padded in this 512-bit buffer, which is then treated as uh, 16 words. The rest of this uh, W array uh, is filled up. It's an 80-word uh, array of 32-bit words. Using um, each of these entries is a, is a result of four XORs of earlier entries in the, in the uh, array and a rotate. So this uh, creates the W array, which is uh, where the input comes from. Then the actual uh, SHA compression function works like this, and we have five 32-bit words which hold the state. These get processed. The main thing that happens is this big five-way addition. There's five values that are brought together in an arithmetic sum here, modulo 2 to the 32. We bring in a value from our W array. There's a amount <coughs> constant. And there's this function f, which is uh, uh, takes three of the words as input, and it's either selection, parity, or the majority <coughs> function. Um, and then uh, these are done bitwise, bitwise arithmetic, whereas this again is modulo 2 to the 32. So that's where it's helpful in the um, Kramer and Domgard system that you can do both kinds of calculations. So the plan 
is we'll transform the program. Instead of having our variables be 32-bit variables, they're arrays of bit commitments with 32 entries. So each variable that we saw there is now an array, but it's still a single variable. It's all written in C. And then when we need to, we'll translate those to the value commitments. Um, but what we end up doing then is that we'll have parallel execution. The prover is executing the code. The verifier is executing almost the same code. And, um, and so they're working together, as I showed in the earlier slide. And what I've got is a library of the primitive operations on these bit commitment arrays. We have Boolean and arithmetic operations. So you translate the original program, which has straightforward arithmetic, and you substitute for those uh, function calls into the library to um, perform the operations that way. This is all done using uh, CryptoLib, which had a IO operations on large integers, so it was really convenient. I'll show you just a little <coughs> sample of the code. I'll show you both in the form in which it's used in the zero knowledge proof and in the form in the original form, so you can take side by side and see what kinds of transformations have to be done. Originally, this is a, just a fragment of the compression function. Here's where we're doing the add function. There's the four different types that are, that are used. And here's the big add that I showed, where there's five values coming together and being added. So the corresponding code over here, once we've converted it to work with the zero knowledge proof, each of those uh, operations has become a function call. Here's that five operand add, and I uh, now have a function which adds the five values. Uh, <coughs> and, and, uh, so that's the kind of substitution that you have to do. And so, the real question then is how long does all this take, and how long does it take to execute? <coughs> Pre-computation, as I described, is relatively costly. This is where we set up a pool of bit commitments between the two sides. For the case of a SHA-1 argument, where the prover is, um, is privacy is protected, it takes 40 minutes to calculate that on my machine, which is the 200 megahertz Pentium. Six megabytes of data is exchanged. And then when you actually go to the protocol, it only takes 100 seconds with 22 kilobytes. The zero, uh, zero knowledge proof takes about twice as much resources. So if anyone is uh, interested in seeing how this stuff works, this is my email address right there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.